Today's episode of the Bitcoin Show is brought to you by usgoldcoins.com, 1-800-HOT-COIN, and Meze Grill, M-E-Z-E Grill.com, and TradeHill.com, and Mt. Gox, M-T-G-O-X.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Bitcoin Show, episode number 29. I'm Bruce Wagner. This is Manny Mena. And today we have a lot of stuff to talk about. I don't know how we're going to get it all in, but uh, it seems like <laughs> twice a day we have breaking news here. Then the Bitcoin world, things that happen in Bitcoin time. We, I used to call it internet speed, but it's really like Bitcoin speed. It's so crazy. Um, the, uh, today, we, our special guest is... Uh, Kior Mithawala from CampBX.com. Did I pronounce it right? You did, Bruce. Okay, great. Welcome. It's Kior. Kior, yes. Kior, Kior. Okay. Uh, it's not spelled like like English fanatics. <laughs> Kior. <laughs> Got it. So uh, from CampBX.com. Now, CampBX is a new, ex relatively new exchange site uh, based in the U.S. in Atlanta. And we're do also we're kind of doing Bitcoin uh, Atlanta Bitcoin Week because we've got uh, a few guests from Atlanta startups on this week. We'll have another one tomorrow, which is interesting from um, bit-pay.com, right? Bit-pay.com. Yes. So only from BitPay. Yeah, BitPay, bit-pay, because there's another thing called BitPay, and well, that's an Android app, but it's not related, I guess. But anyway, mm -hmm. bit-pay, I'll say. And um, but Camp BX, you just launched, right? When was that? We did. Uh, today is our third week anniversary. Wow. Believe it or not, Bruce, when we were preparing for the show, we just crossed 1,000 users threshold. 1,000 users? Yes. Wow, that's pretty we fast. Come on your show more often. We should what? We should come on your show more often. Every day. We do it every day. We, you're welcome. Absolutely. You can come and just sit down right here. You know, we're, you're actually going to be here because. Um, I'll remind a, a shameless plug for the, uh, as you guys know all about it, the uh, Bitcoin Conference and World Expo NYC 2011 in NYC is coming up August 19, 20, and 21. We're also going to have, if you're coming early, we're going to have a little bit of pre-conference fun on Thursday, August 18. Then the conference will start Friday, August 19th. Saturday is the big day, August 20th. And then uh, half a day, uh, pretty much of formal stuff on Sunday, the 21st. And then we'll have post-conference festivities on Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening. It's going to be a blast. So later today, actually, within a few hours today, we'll have it all up there on BitcoinConference.com. BitcoinConference.com, all the details. Mm -hmm. So you want to be sure and register. And we're going to announce, actually, we may as well go ahead and announce that um, Friday morning, 10 a.m. Eastern time. This Friday morning, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern, which is, uh, you know, Friday, July 29th mm -hmm. at 10 a.m. Eastern time is when the actual tickets will go on sale and you can buy them with Bitcoin. So you've got three days to buy some Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. uh, if you need to buy some and you don't have any Bitcoins, just call us and we'll arrange it. But we want to, of course, we're not taking PayPal. We, we do not take PayPal, MasterCard, Visa, mm -hmm. not even Douala. We only take Bitcoin. <laughs> and it is important to state that the seating is limited. Yeah, that's right. The seating is limited. We're, we're only, we're only um, reserving 20, I'm sorry, 50, 50 spots. So you want to be sure to get there 10 a.m. Eastern time to BitcoinConference.com and buy your admission and also your vendor tables, vendor booth space or table space, really. It's, it's Manhattan, mm -hmm. so it's not a booth. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> table. But anyway, um, it's going to be kind of small sp space, but there'll be, it'll be very cozy and oh my God, it's going to be fun. People are flying from China, from uh, Central South America, Australia. I heard some rumors somebody's chartering a private jet to fly here. It's going to be really, really fun. Amazing. A lot of companies 
are uh, saving their announcements and their products, technologies, and demonstrations for this conference. And also, um, rumors of major media like uh, Al Jazeera English, more than rumors, they told me Al Jazeera English wants to be here mm -hmm. and CNN International and so on. They're going to, uh, they have talked about coming. And so I think there'll be a lot of major media coverage mm -hmm. here. And I think it'd be really pivotal to the Bitcoin community just to get a congregation going on, some discussion going on between different vendors and services and help, you know, push some, you know, hopefully revolutionary Bitcoin products and mm -hmm. services that can make it more ubiquitous. Innovation, brainstorming, nothing happens better than when you put brains together. And when with all these like-minded people, not only are they like-minded philosophically and technologically um, and, you know, even politically, whatever, they, um, they put all their heads together and they, they're gonna, everybody's going to see each other's ideas and go, wow, we could take that and, and what could we do if we put our heads together? It's going to be really exciting stuff. So make sure you get there. Uh, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, Friday morning, BitcoinConference.com and buy your tickets. And um, we'll see. If we sell out like mad really fast, we'll, we'll, then we'll start a waiting list. And if we have to, we'll move it to a larger venue. I mean, we've got a backup plan. So, you know, Absolutely. if we... I think you have at least four people flying in from Atlanta. At least four people. Okay, there we go. We just sold the first four. So you got, but you got to be there at 10 a.m. on Friday. <laughs> we, we won't block you out. Banner ready for the Bitcoin World Conference. You know, we just we are just waiting for you to announce so we put up the banner. Yes. On if, our if, website. Yeah, we won't lock you out. I promise. <laughs> Somehow, you. there's a. We'll get you guys in if we have to bring you in the back door through the catering entrance. We're going to get you in. But it's actually right now the venue is only One TV Studios. We have the whole fifth floor um, at, at 295th Avenue, and this is where we're at. So right now, this is the venue. I mean, hotels in Manhattan are crazy and small. Most of the hotels don't have a meeting space, or if they do, it they only have a maximum of 16 people or something absurd like that. Mm -hmm. We have some big studios so we're going to rearrange things and you know make a few rooms off limits but we're going to convert conference rooms and and our main big studio one which you guys don't normally see because this is a smaller one um, and we're going to convert it basically into a convention center we'll see how that works but if we if we run into um, you know a massive number of people wanting to come like uh, twice as many as we expect we will probably have to move it to a, a larger venue but we can we can do that so you know just get there buy your tickets and and if and if it is sold out make sure you uh, send us an email uh, like if you get blocked out because they were sold out send us an email at um, what is it registration at uh, Bitcoinme.com. Is, is it registration or yeah. register? Register. Whatever it is. Go to, bit, go to bitcoinconference.com and the email address will be there. And make sure you send us an email so that you get on a waiting list. And that way we'll have an idea of how many people really want to come. And we're also trying to make the, uh, the admission very, very affordable. You'll see all the details will be up there soon. It's today. register. Register. R-E-G-I-S-T-E-R -E -E at bitcoinconference.com. There you go. And, but obviously, uh, you, you, don't, you only have to do that if you, haven't, uh, if you weren't able to get in the first 50 that are sold. All right, so back to uh, Kate Kayor. I can't even say your name right. Kayor? At the end of the show, you will. I will. I'll, I'll get it. It takes me seven times, and I'll get your name. So is it Kayor? Yes, it is. Got that? Kayor. Remind me. Okay, so uh, <laughs> tell us about Camp BX. What does BX mean? Is that like barracks? Bitcoin crossroads. Oh, Bitcoin. Uh, uh, that's what we were aiming for. Uh, the camp word comes from the feeling of brotherhood. Uh, oh, okay. We, were, we had a vision of a camp at the Bitcoin crossroads where people get together, exchange their regular currencies for Bitcoin, and enter a new world. Okay, Bitcoin crossroads, or Bitcoin exchange, obviously. Bitcoin it stands exchange. for X, too. Um, so, all right, cool. So it's been uh, three weeks. Mm -hmm. How is it going? What What's your... Um, you've got a thousand... Uh, members now. Yes. How's the volume? Is it is is there volume happening the yet? The volume is picking up, too, Bruce. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that there is a tipping point somewhere around two thousand users. Around two thousand, so yeah. Three thousand users. That's when the activity really picks up. Yeah, yeah, because we, they can be users, know, but volume when Bitcoin prices fluctuate more. Right, but right. When the prices are stable, uh, the volume, of course, tends to be low for everyone. Right, that makes sense. Okay, now one of the things that. Um, well, there's so much going on. Um, I don't know where to begin. I mean, um, I, I think probably we should talk about what's breaking first, and then I want to get into some more details about Camp BX. Um, one of the, the thing that we broke yesterday in, in the last episode of the Bitcoin show, which was, what, 28, um, is this Dwala crisis, I guess we could call it, in that um, Trade Hill 
Bitcoin.com has um, detected transactions being reversed and actual statements, like they're basically a bank statement. It's a mm -hmm. Dwala um, statement that a merchant would get. It's like a bank statement actually retroactively being changed. Um, they're online statements, so if you don't print them and then actually study them and compare the old ones to the new ones, you would never even know. Mm -hmm. And so, which kind of explains um, why it took so long for people to notice, because if you go to the online statement and you ex assume that it's, it's not, it's stagnant, you know, they tell you, if you ask them, they were told, Trade Hill was told that no, statements can't change, no, transactions can't reverse. And meanwhile, the transactions they claim are changing, um, the transactions are reversing and the statements are changing. Now this, um, this is uh, Trade Hill saying that approximately $40,000 worth of transactions have been lost uh, because of these transactions that were cleared and they got an email saying they were cleared and it says on the statement they were cleared then days later they are uncleared now this just came in um, this is we just got notification of this from uh, uh, magical tux's his handle which is mark who owns mount gox now originally you know as soon as this happened i, I got a hold of mark and he said no uh, he we're not affected let me check he checked again Nope, we're not affected. Over 20,000 transactions from Dwala, not affected. Um, the thing is, I fear that what I feared at that moment was that he was checking his statement and his balance and they matched. And that's a problem because the statement may have been changed yes. and he's, he's looking at the new statement. And the this is why a merchant would never notice. So if the, they take something out from the statement, they're also going to take it out from your balance. Yeah, of course. But I, I hope that this was just a total oversight or error or system software error on Dwala's part and this was not intentional. We all hope that this was not intentional because if this is intentional, this is really, really fraudulent in my opinion from the, from the merchant's perspective to modify a statement that's already happened when you tell people that that can't happen and to reverse transactions when you're told as a merchant that they cannot be reversed. And as you heard on yesterday's episode 28, um, I called and I said, can, I'm a merchant. If I'm a merchant, yes. can transactions be, you know, that are cleared be reversed? He said, no, absolutely not. And then he goes, you know, well, unless the bank reports an NSF. I'm like, oh, well, okay. So if it, aside from an NSF, once it's clear, obviously if there's an NSF, it's not mm -hmm. cleared. But if it's cleared, aside from an NSF condition, once it's cleared, they can't be reversed. Is that right? He's, a, he's right, they cannot be reversed. And then later he goes on to backpedal and backpedal. I think he recognized my voice, which explains why I got an email three minutes later when I hadn't even told him my name. You know, that he had just talked to the COO within three minutes after I hung up with him and I got an email when I hadn't even told him my name. All right, so whatever, that is what it is. Now, um, we, we, this just in, basically. <laughs> Um, Mark um, Carpelli, from who's the owner of, of Mount Gox, as you guys know, um, was saying, um, this is from the uh, IRC chat room, the, the Bitcoin IRC chat room. He's saying, uh, someone was asking him, any comments on the Dwala issues some other exchanges are having? And he says, so far, no problems here. Uh, I'm not sure this log speaks exactly of the same problem. Uh, Let's see, there has been almost no occurrence and we have detected those. Um, and, but he goes on to say, I see three points why Dwala is at fault. And he mentions um, false advertising about the lack of chargebacks, number one, saying that there are no chargebacks. Of course, now they've modified their help system and their FAQ and their blogs and things, like right. retroactively going back and changing them as if they were never there. The internet doesn't forget people. Don't lie, because you're not. You're going to get busted on the internet. The internet doesn't forget. You can't lie on the internet. You just can't. You're going to get busted. All right. So not that they're lying, but you know. Anyway, they're changing their policies quickly, which is understandable. Uh, but they advertise that there can't be chargebacks, and they must have known. Of course, there can be chargebacks if they're using ACH. All right. Anyway, no communication with the merchant when a transaction is reversed. What is that about? I mean, this is Mark from Mt. Gox saying that this is another thing. He, it's very disturbing to him, even though he checked his balances and everything's okay, that uh, the, the, uh, this uh, you know, claim that there, there's no communication with the merchant when a transaction is reversed, absolutely inappropriate, right? And then, facil well, he's saying, not communicating with the merchant prevents the merchant from taking appropriate actions 
with law enforcement, etc. Because if these are fraudulent account holders and you don't even tell the merchant, then they're going to continue. They're going to continue doing this. So they put in money and they say it cleared and then they just, oops, just erase it. You know, pretend like nobody saw that. You didn't see that, did you? And then they, the, the fraud continues and continues and continues. Like Douala is actually like aiding and abetting the fraud if they don't tell the merchant that it happened. They reverse the transaction and say, shh, this is our little secret. Don't tell the merchant. You know, that's not cool because then it, 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 it makes the fraud grow exponentially. These mm -hmm. fraudsters will only do it more, obviously. Now, Trade Hill caught this with their software that they created to compare, you know, uh, statement with statement, and they caught it, luckily, but they still, they're still like $40,000 down. I can't imagine. All right, all right. So now, Mark about Gox says no. Um, as far as he's concerned, he checked. Everything's good. I mean, he checked like it only took him moments. So I don't know how much checking he possibly did in those moments, but he must, I'm assuming he must have just been checking. Uh, uh, if I can jump in real quick. Yes. Uh, you know, what happened with Trade Hill, it's very unfortunate. $37,000 is not a small amount for any new company. But right. I'm surprised that they caught it so late. Because so late? Yeah. What you do essentially at the end of the day, no matter what business you have, if you have a Bitcoin business, if you have a cash register business, is you run a tally. How much you have in the bank account, how much you have in the database. Right. And uh, running this tally is very quick and very easy. So we have built in a report that comes in at the end of the day and uh, it shows you if the tally matches up. If there were any reversals, you would have the Dwala balance go down but your database balance will show you a little bit higher amount. And when you see that happen, you know that there was some reversal. Right, well, now Trade Hill. You know, we have processed over a few hundred dollar transfers, mm -hmm. but we have not seen any of the reversals in our daily tally. And I think that's what Mark Karpilis at Mount Gox might have done the same thing. Uh, he might have run a tally. So if you find a discrepancy, of course you have to dig deeper, but running a tally, it's a very quick and yeah. easy problem. Well, now they, Trade Hill said that they actually were doing that, and they did catch it. They caught it early on, but they contacted Dwala and they said, "No, no, everything is fine." They're, and they they basically put it back on them, and that the, must, the mis mistake must be on you. And so Trade Hill were, spent a lot of time trying to figure out what is wrong with their own internal auditing that this mistake could. Where's the mistake? I mean, they dug and dug and dug, and they couldn't find the mistake until finally. It occurred to them that they should actually audit Dwala, that the mistake wasn't on their side, that, that it was Dwala's statements that were not uh, correct. And so finally, they, they actually developed software to audit Dwala's statements over time, and that's how they caught it. Now, it, And actually, now that I understand how it happened, I mean, if you assume that your bank statement on your online banking is correct and they're not playing with the numbers, you're starting with that assumption, then you're not going to doubt what you see on the screen. Mm -hmm. There is a uh, ball as an out here. Uh, the statement that Trade Hill is using, these are the CSV files, right. and they are not the official monthly statement. They are provided as an additional service to the exchanges, but you are not supposed to base your transaction off of that. According well, to Bola, the official statement comes out at the end of the month. And that is the only valid statement that you should base your transactions on. Right, but the uh, so they, they have technical out here, but I agree with you 100 percent that yeah. they have done an unethical thing by reversing the transactions without yeah. notifying the merchant. Well, yeah, and I as mean, as soon as you shed some light on it, Dwala really woke up. I think you lit a fire under them. So I was able to get a hold of their support team yesterday at 11 p.m. Yeah, and they responded to all my questions with an urgency. Yeah. Oh, really? They responded to your questions at 11 p.m. with urgency. We made a positive suggestion. We said, so far, we have a business plan. We are well capitalized. If we had any losses, we would have been easily able to absorb them. Yeah. Fortunately, we don't have any losses. You don't have any losses? Or, sorry, no, absolutely not, Bruce. Uh, not even a single dollar missing from day one to week three. But you did find um, some fraudulent uh, uh, yeah. people using Dwala fraudulently. Right, and that was the user hacking. Uh, there, we found some Dwala accounts that were hacked by the users in uh, probably Eastern European countries. Right. So we receive a deposit from Minneapolis, uh, and uh, when we do the verification on that deposit, turns out numbers are going to offshore phone numbers. 
There are IP addresses coming in from Czech Republic, uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. So we were able to catch these incidents very early. Okay, so you were doing a lot of exceptional verifying. Right. So mm -hmm. we have a rules engine built on top of that. It looks at your IP address. It looks at your amount of activity, mm -hmm. which looks at how often uh, you use the transactions, how quickly the transactions move from registration through buying, selling, and drawing. Right. And when you put all these together using simple statistical rules, you can flag the accounts which may be fun. Mm -hmm. So we have a process in place to notify Dwala. Uh, in fact, this morning we notified Dwala about three accounts that may have been compromised. Okay. So they are investigating right now and we are expecting an update any minute. Okay. Now this is, um, this is the continuation of the story uh, with Mt. Gox, just for everyone's information. So then <laughs> Mark continues. Um, or later, actually, this is this is later in IRC. He says uh, he's continuing the conversation. He says, "So um, someone says to him, so when you detect those, and it sounds like, unfortunately for you, there haven't been, or uh, sounds like, fortunately for you, there haven't been many. You just eat the loss." And he says, "Yes, we do." So he has detected them. Okay. He says some transactions just vanish. This is Mark from Mt. Gox saying this. Some transactions just vanish. So he's having the same experience. Now and remember, they're all using the same backend. They're using the CSV file download, which is a web service available from Vala. Yeah. So as long as you are using this avenue to process your transactions, you will have this error. Well, the thing is that that is, I mean, they can say it's not their official statement, but I'm sorry, it is their official statement. If you give me a statement and it comes from you, it is your official statement. And also, Dwala said, uh, told them over the phone that um, if you receive an email from us confirming that the transaction is cleared, then that's absolutely official. And you can see from the presentation we did in the last episode, there's the email. There's the email confirming this transaction has cleared and it matches the CSV. The CSV is exactly in coordination with the email. So what they're doing is they're absolutely clearing it on their official statement, their email, their CSV, and all that. Now, you know, that's official. I'm sorry, that's official. I don't care what you say. I mean, then don't give it to me if it's not accurate. That's nonsense. That's a nonsense, bogus excuse, in my opinion. If you give me a transaction email and you give me the matching spreadsheet and a CSV, and then you tell me that's not official, that's nonsense. Okay, you're, they no, told them you they can rely on that. Uh, you know, the reality of the business is going to be ACH network allows rollback. Exactly. So if it's a small amount, Bola will absorb it, but simply from a business continuation standpoint, they have to pass some of the rollbacks on to their customers. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, but not when you when you deceive the customers. When you tell merchants there's no such thing as a chargeback. When you tell merchants once it's cleared, it's cleared, then you are being disingenuous. That is absolute. That's consumer fraud, I think, under the definitions of consumer fraud. That is called consumer fraud, and isn't that a felony? I mean, that's serious. That's really, really serious. They should at least notify that something happened. And then without even notifying you, reversing the transactions without saying a word. They talk about an arbitration a system that they have in place. How about not communicate it, don't tell anybody, just change the numbers, fudge last month's numbers. No, that's not okay. All right, so then Mark continues, some transactions just vanish. This is Mt. Gox. And remember, you know, if, the same, if, we're, if, we, if you were to assume, I don't know that this is true, but if you were to assume, you know, Mount, uh, Trade Hill says two and a half percent of their transactions last month were, were, were reversed like this, were disappeared. Yeah. And if that same percentage applied to the volume Mount Gox is doing, we're talking about, about half a million dollars of disappeared yeah. money. Some, yeah, who, who's going to eat that cost? About hundred million dollars a year, so yeah. Two, yeah. even one and a half percent of that, that's a lot of amount. I mean, Dwala, like I said yesterday, Dwala has only three customers. Their biggest customer, which is the majority of their business, from what I hear, is Mt. Gox. Their second largest customer, which is pretty much the rest of their business, is Trade Hill. And then everybody else is a tiny little fraction. Basically, Dwala is Bitcoin. Dwala is Mt. It's kind of like, you know, like they say about Walmart, you know, Walmart is China. I mean, it's like everything comes from China. It's like that. I mean, Dwala is Mt. Gox and Trade Hill. You put Mt. Gox and Trade Hill to combine, and that pretty much is Dwala's business. So, and they don't want to be associated with Bitcoin, nothing to do with Bitcoin. But meanwhile, they are a Bitcoin, com they're actually a central point of failure in the Bitcoin uh, system that we have presently. So that's why it's so relevant to the Bitcoin world. But um, it's absolutely, I mean, there's so many things that are not right. 
I mean, to tell people that transactions um, cannot uh, be reversed, and then to actually reverse statements that have already happened, and then not communicate mm -hmm. anything to the merchant, what is that? that? I mean, PayPal doesn't even do that. And right. It's crazy. Okay, then, let's see, Mark, I want to continue this. Mark says, some transactions just vanish. I send them an email about that. Um, he sent them an email about that. Uh, all right. So basically, Mark is saying, yes, it, it is happening. And it is happening at Mt. Gox, too. And I bet you he's really busy checking that out right now because we're talking about a lot of money. Um, you know, I, I also want everybody to know that I, I did contact, you know, the CEO of Dwala, and I asked him to be on the show actually repeatedly. And I got a nice letter, you know, uh, saying declining to be interviewed. Um, so, you know, and Trade Hill, um, you know, everybody loves Dwala as a service, as a technology. It's a great thing. Uh, but, but, you know, it, it's all about trust because you're talking about money. You're talking about, you know, as I say, OPM, other people's money. And when you're messing with other people's money, man, you do not mess with that. And it has to be, it, you have to have the utmost uh, transparency and honesty and communication above all else. Even when you screw up, even when you make a mistake or the computer makes a mistake, you have to be honest and you have to communicate that. You don't hide mm -hmm. behind a phone and say, no, he's not available for weeks at a time to your largest customer that has, you know, half a million dollars at stake or whatever the thing is. I mean, that's just not cool. It's absolutely not cool. I don't care if you do say you're the and dumbest man in the room. Was, you know, not, not taking to all our side at all. Uh, yesterday, I was one of the audience when you were taking this news live, and it came as a shock to me. And uh, Dwala has definitely messed up here, but we have a commitment from them that by the end of the week, they're going to make it right. I hope so. I mean, we, I only wish the best for them. Uh, but. The three steps that we were talking about before the show is that the rollbacks are not going to completely disappear. What needs to happen is that there needs to be a process around rollbacks. So any Dwala customers like CampyX, Trade Hill, or Hong Kong, we can manage our risk. Right. You know, if, if there is a process, you can manage the process, you can manage the risk. Yeah. So the yeah. recommendations that we put in front of Lala are, number one, the vendor must be notified. Ignorance and hoping that this will slide by, it is not an answer. You have to have a vendor notification and you have to have a mediation process that is agreed upon by all of, all of the parties involved in the dispute. Right. <laughs> and I mean, the thing is that if no, you... Right. So... Oh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, by the end of the week, they are going to update their process documentation. Uh, they are also going to uh, send us some additional information about how the rollbacks are going to happen. How are they going to be mediated? And uh, it's what is going to be covered by. Right. I mean, the thing is, if if you guys you in the exchange industry, mm -hmm. if you wanted to take all this chargeback uh, liability then you would just accept MasterCard, Visa, and PayPal, and you wouldn't need Dwala in the first place. But when you're promised that there's no such thing as a chargeback, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're basing your business around that. So it's just not honest. It's just not honest to say that there's no chargebacks and then, oh, yeah, there are. Oh, we updated our FAQ today. Okay, but what about last week, last month? You know, that's not okay. It's, you can't just pretend it didn't happen and rewrite history. You've got to stand up, so be a man, and face the, the, face the music. You know, no matter uh, what business you have, chargebacks have to be a, pl a part of the business plan. Unless you're dealing with cash, yeah. Function. There is retail that uh, anywhere from 3 to three, 5%. Mm -hmm. So you build that into the business plan for retail operations. Right. So CampyX has done the same thing. Our threshold is about 1%. We can take 1% chargebacks and keep rolling without a problem. But if what are your more chargebacks in a month? We can absorb them for a short period, but it's not sustainable in the long. Term. Right. I mean, aren't you, how, how, what are the fees? So by the way, you will have to build your business plan. Now that we're talking about can't special of what chargeback you are going to accept, what you are not going to accept. Right. So, um, so speaking of can't be X, because obviously you are can't be X. What? What? I mean, am I misunderstanding something? Like, are if you your fees? Like, what are the what are the exchange fees that can't be X charges? Uh, the CampyX exchange fees are 0.055%. Okay, so explain to me how you can accept a 1% chargeback if your fees are less than 1%. And that comes up from the volume. Uh, 
when you are paying certain amount of volume, you uh, keep in mind that you charge the fees both sides of the. Oh uh, right. Market, right. There is a buy transaction. There is also a sell transaction, mm -hmm. and we feel have a very thin margin to live with, but we can rolling with percent charge. Okay. Yeah, and you're okay. I understand. And the exchanges and are happening uh, even when they're not withdrawing the money. A second parameter to that: a dollar transfer is one time. Right. If you transfer thousand dollars into your account, that is thousand dollars of risk for us. Right. But once to the thousand dollars, you are going to cycle it multiple times. You are going to trade yeah. it three times, five times your initial capital. Yeah. You are going to buy for a thousand dollars. You are going to sell for a thousand dollars, and you are going to keep churning. Yeah. So the profits generate on thousand dollars of capital. They are more than uh, the percentage that the charge is part. Right, and there's no chargeback risk when you're allowing them to withdraw via Dwala. Obviously, there's only a risk when they're uh, uploading, when they're depositing money via Dwala. So that makes sense. Exactly. Okay. So, so yeah, cycling gives you more profit than what you made. I mean, is is Dwala the only way to fund your account at Camp BX right now? Yes, it is the only way at present. Uh, we are working on additional ways uh, to bring in safe payments for Europe, mm -hmm. and uh, we are also in talks with PayPal to mm -hmm. use the digital service. Wow. Okay. Why don't you allow wire regular bank wire transfers? Because wire transfers are hard to regulate. Uh, from a compliance stand. When you have a wire transfer come in, there is no way you can refuse the transaction without incurring a penalty on your side. So mm -hmm. our compliance program, it builds around the automated transaction gateways or payment processing gateways. Mm -hmm. Every time a roll up payment comes in, there are some rules that are applied to incoming traffic uh, see if we are not reaching any of the things in regulation. This is not a concern for offshore uh, Companies like Trade Mill or Funcoms because they don't fall inside the regulation. Mm -hmm. But for us, uh, this is a top priority. So you if can stop with any money, uh, money from any company that is not based in the United States. Mm -hmm. And all, that's why we don't accept the word because that money is based, I believe, in Costa Rica. Uh, all of our payment processors have to be based in the United States, and uh, they have to have a documented process that we can use for matching. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you are you saying with Dwala you can actually stop the the payment from coming in if you want to? Yes. Mm hmm. Okay. So uh, that's interesting. Is that that's based on an automatic filtering of some sort? No, it is a manual process. You have to reach out to Dwala right now. Oh. Okay. But they are working on the putting in more automation in place. Okay. All right. So. That's interesting. So that you can do, you have that control with Dwala or PayPal or something, but you don't have that with a bank wire. But I mean, with a bank wire, it's still tied to the person sending it. But you're saying it you is. you don't it have to know your customer. Process. You know, re reversing a bank wire payment is much more documentation intensive okay. than bulk. You okay. have to go to your bank. You have to talk to them. You know, you fill out the form to send out the return transfer. Versus Dwala, it's just a quick form. And what about mm -hmm. Mastercard and Visa? Because like, if you're gonna if you're gonna tolerate chargebacks within a certain range, why not just accept Visa, Mastercard, American Express? Yes, so uh, that's something we are looking into right now. Really? But I think that is the next step in making Bitcoin more legitimate. Mm -hmm. As long as we are using uh, offshore payment mechanisms like Liberty Reserve, it's always going to be seen as sort of fringe. Mode. The oh, okay. more we want to move into the center of the economy, we have to accept credit cards and traditional avenues of payment like PayPal. Okay, so if you have a, I mean, if you have, if you accept credit cards, you're going to have a tremendous chargeback liability for up to six months. People can take, put it, buy ten thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, and reverse ten thousand dollars of payments five five months and three weeks later, and say, "Screw you!" It's I used American Express. And there, there, there are processes around that. So. Uh, if you are doing one-off credit card transactions, mm -hmm. of course, it's very difficult to manage and put the process together. Mm -hmm. But when you have hundreds of transactions coming through, you can have specialized software that scans for fraud, mm -hmm. that scans for unusual activity on uh, credit card accounts. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have a relationship with the payment processor, mm -hmm. they tend to rule in the favor of the vendor rather than in favor of the customer. Really? That hasn't been my experience. I mean, I, I've had a relationship with credit card processing. If, if you are processing anywhere more than uh, 300 to 500 transactions with a small payment processor, mm. they are going to take your business as a very legitimate business. Mm -hmm. That if you are dealer, 
dealing with 500 customers and you have zero complaints so far. Suddenly, mm. three complaints pop up. Mm. They are not uh, going to rule by default against. You. They are going to look into this very serious. Okay, I've had experience mm. with with some of them where, uh, like American Express Platinum, and they I was told flat out by American Express that they always side on the side of the card holder. If it's a platinum card, it doesn't matter what the what documentation. I could have their fingerprint and a blood sample and a contract and notarized. It doesn't matter they, if it's a platinum card holder. They side on the side of the card holder. It doesn't matter the circumstances. I mean, that's what I was told. So I mean, I don't know. It's interesting. And what about uh, the PayPal is different. PayPal has a policy of siding towards the vendor. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in, in my previous experiences with PayPal, when, whenever there were a discrepancy, if you can prove that there was a transfer, there was a valid transaction, mm -hmm. uh, which included some physical proof, like mailing a receipt to the customer, mm -hmm. PayPal will rule in favor of the Okay. Now, the, um, let's see, what about the, the, there have been merchants who've tried to set up operations where they're just literally just flat out selling Bitcoins for MasterCard and Visa. And MasterCard, Visa, International, or their merchant processor, or their bank, whatever, has pulled their account and said, and just shut them down because they didn't want to be associated with, uh, you know, a, 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 whatever, virtual currency or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that is that up to MasterCard, Visa, International, or your bank, or your processing company? Who makes that decision? And how, what do you do when they, when they yank your account? Right. So, this is an agreement you need to have with them before you start your business. Mm -hmm. And that's the step we are at right now. Uh, I'm sure you've experienced this all the time when you tell someone new about Bitcoins, they Google it. And the first news that pops up is Chuck Schumer, Chris Dodd. The first thing that uh, comes up is what? Uh, the first news that pops up is Chuck Schumer and Chris Dodd trying to ban, ban Bitcoin or Silk Road. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. So Schumer, there's yeah. a public perception issue, uh, but when people go in, engage with the vendor and show them that we have the right permissions in place, they're a legitimate business. In Georgia, uh, right. you know, not offshore. Mm -hmm. They are willing to talk to us. They are willing to take us very soon. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So I'm, I'm hoping the public understands that you know these are just clowns trying to get publicity, and uh, you know they really need to ban the green paper coming from the private corporation called the Federal Reserve if they want to bust uh, you know crime and drugs. They really need to crack down on those green pieces of paper. And take that away from the people yeah. and see if the people well, stand up against that. What is the thing, Bruce? Uh, you think about it. Bitcoin payments are not the problem. You know how Silk Road ships the drugs? Ship them to USPS. Right. They use the government postal s system. Yeah. But exactly. Like a US Ban system. that. It's more than the payment issue. It doesn't matter if you pay. If you can stop the shipment, if you can track the source of it. Yeah. That is your issue. Yeah. They need to ban uh, postal mail. They need to ban the post offices. They need to ban cash, cars, and phones, especially cell phones. Yeah, they need to ban trucks, cars, everything. I know, it's just absurd. Like, let's just ban the internet. It's so silly. I mean, I hope that the public is not, I mean, is smarter than that. I really do give the public credit that, they're, that they see these people like Schumer, and he's just a clown. He just doesn't have the, the big shoes and the, the red nose, but he's an absolute clown. I mean, I hope that people can see that. That's, it has nothing to do with Bitcoin or technology. It's, it has to do with, you know, being, uh, it has to do with donations to your political campaign, you know, more than anything else. So, all right. So back to, back to uh, Cat BX. I have some questions because you're going to specialize in, you're in the United States and you're going to, you're going to be uh, super compliant and you're also going to get into options trading, right? That is correct. So, um, I, I've got questions about that because especially when you talk about United States compliance and mm -hmm. options trading, you put those three together and I asked, actually asked some of our audience to send us uh, some questions, which I want to get to in one second, but this is actually a really good time <laughs> to thank the people who are bringing us to you. So let's take a quick break and I want to thank usgoldcoins.com. If you want to diversify your investments and not put all your Bitcoins into one big Bitcoin wallet, uh, you want to diversify, um, think about um, the second best, maybe, <laughs> or it could be the first, it depends on your opinion, but that is rare, as otherwise known as numismatic gold and silver coins. usgoldcoins.com, 1-800-HOT-COIN is their number, is actually Andy Gauss. Andy Gauss is, is uh, my monetary guru. He knows everything about money, in my opinion. He is the world-renowned expert, and he's actually going to be hosting The Real World of Money here on Only One TV, Wednesday mornings, 10 a.m., but... 
not only that, he's a sponsor, but not only that, he's a friend. We actually uh, began our relationship with him by listening to his show. He's got a radio show every week, twice a week actually, and which is moving to only one TV. But uh, we were big fans and we became customers and we became friends. And I absolutely vouch for his integrity. He's not like these, you know, cash for gold nonsense. This is the real thing. You call his number and ask for Andy and you got Andy. You can ask him about your mortgage. I mean, he's, he's an absolute expert. But call him up and thank him for sponsoring the Bitcoin show and bringing us to you every day, every, every day, 2 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday, and all the other languages and other shows on Only One TV. But it's, it's usgoldcoins.com. If you happen to be in the U.S., it's easy to call 1-800-HOT-COIN. How can you forget that? 1-800-HOT-COIN. Call him up and thank him for sponsoring the show. And Meze Grill. Meze Grill, M-E-Z-E, grill.com. Obviously, everybody knows that Meze Grill's claim to fame is um, they're, they're the world's first brick and mortar restaurant to accept Bitcoin. Um, they also have other things like authentic Mediterranean food that has excellent flavor. It's our favorite restaurant, one of our favorite restaurants, and that's how we actually met Marwan, who owns Meze Grill. And um, it, they're serving breakfast now. If you're in New York City or you're passing through New York City, it's just a couple blocks south of Columbus Circle, and this is as good a time as any to make this little announcement about Mezzi Grill. Mezzi Grill has announced that they are going to be selling Bitcoin at the retail level. You'll be able to walk into Mezzi Grill and buy and sell Bitcoin. So I, I just talked with Marwan yesterday and he's agreed to, to do this. So that's coming any minute we're going to be able to do that. So he is or he's going to be able to do that. So um, you'll be able to literally walk into a brick and mortar store retail outlet and, and maybe, I don't know if this is the first in the world, but probably the first in New York, where you have a known location, address, and hours. You can go there anytime that they're open, which is obviously long days and long hours, seven days a week. They're open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you can buy Bitcoin. And you can sell Bitcoin, too. So uh, basically, uh, you know, for a small percentage fee, but at the you know, last price, market price, very fair. So uh, Mezzi Grill, not only the world's first restaurant to accept Bitcoins, but the, maybe the world's first brick and mortar retail outlet that you can buy and sell Bitcoins in person for cash. All right. And thank them for sponsoring as well as Trade Hill. Obviously, Trade Hill is the exchange site that makes it really easy to buy Bitcoin without, without even going to Mezzi Grill, without even going out of your house. You can just get online and um, there are many ways to, uh, to buy and sell Bitcoin on the online exchange, tradehill.com. Uh, obviously, you can uh, use our referral code TH-R141 and get 10% off of your trade fees for life. Um, they're introducing, they have the euro now and they have, um, you know, so they have, they're introducing currencies and they're introducing more and more ways to get money in and out of Trade Hill. We know them well. These are, these are all our pals. We all talk to them every day. We all know them. And Mt. Gox, obviously, mtgox.com. They're the market leader. Who doesn't know anybody? If you know Bitcoin, you know Mt. Gox. They have the vast majority of the market share in the online exchange. They also have um, two-factor authentication as well. Um, and they now take the euro, the, the British sterling, British pound, Australian dollars, Canadian dollars coming any day. And they have, uh, they're continuing their 0.3% fees through August 9th. So they've got a little bit more time to cash in on those low uh, trade fees. We thank Mt. Gox. So thank all of our sponsors, please. Just email them and say, thanks for sponsoring the Bitcoin show. You don't even have to do business with them. Just thank them for sponsoring the Bitcoin show. You know, let them know that you appreciate what they're doing. So, all right. And then uh, getting into what Camp BX is doing, just for those that don't understand, because options um, actually comes from a pretty advanced uh, portion of the financial sector, which most people who even do options don't really know that underlying like variables are involved with that. So just very quick, 30 seconds. Uh, basically what an option is in terms of finance, it's a derivative financial instrument that sort of specifies a contract in the future between two parties. Um, and it's basically saying, um, I give you the option to buy something a month from now at a set price. Um, and um, basically it's not an obligation, it's just an option to do that. So you're paying a premium for an option and just in case you don't know what a derivative is, uh, that increases the complexity a little bit because basically a derivative in the terms of a financial instrument 
is that uh, basically there's some underlying variables um, that's going to affect uh, what the price is. Um, and this could be anything from a tradable asset or even a non-tradable asset like uh, temperature, which is the case of like weather derivatives or the <laughs> unemployment rate. Um, so it involves a couple of, you know, advanced financial, um, you know, Mm -hmm. options or I don't yeah. know how to explain it but it's a little more on the advanced side but it's pretty interesting because a lot of people are excited about this especially people in Wall Street right so basically the idea is I mean just sort of sum up what you said derivatives are absolutely anything you can you can say derivative of the number of leaves that are gonna fall before this you can just a derivative is just anything you make up and it's a number that can be measured it's just a number that can be measured and you can you can basically buy and sell based on some number options is very specific and that is, like you said, actually options is just like what it sounds like. It's an option to buy something or sell something at a certain price mm -hmm. in the future. So and you're actually buying the option to do that. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, there's, that's, that's... There's also calls, which is, you know, um, which is a call is like um, to buy if you want to buy something in the future. And a put is if you want to sell in the future. Right. So you could go both ways about it. Two types of options. Okay, so now that we got the basics covered, so with the audience, that's good. The audience knows what these are. Now I've got some questions that have, have come in because we, we asked the but audience to send us. Before we jump into options, Bruce. Yes. Uh, options is something we don't have available right now. Okay. What we offer is margin trading. Uh, margin trading is different than options. It gives you a leverage on the current price of Bitcoin. So you put up 50%, you put up the other 50%, and you can make a trade margin trade or a short sale based off of that. Okay, so margin trading is where you're basically borrowing money to buy bitcoins. So you're going to actually so you're actually extending a loan or you're borrowing bitcoins to sell and uh, short sell. So it's basically um, a margin is sort of like a collateral that the holder of which would be Camp BX um, they're going to deposit to cover some of the risk that's inherent with bitcoins if I'm Assuming correct, you're going to cover some of the risk using collateral, and uh, this will allow you to bu uh, short sell bitcoins if, Is that if correct? it looks good. Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you clearly. And well, explain to us. Okay, when you say a margin, you're talking about. Let me let me just ask it in my layman's term because I'm not I'm not a financial person. So if, if you're talking about, uh, if I'm a customer of Camp BX, I have a certain amount of funds on deposit, so I'm a, I can actually borrow more and then uh, use that to buy Bitcoins or buy options? Right. So if you have $100, you can buy Bitcoins up to $200. Okay, so that's or the same thing as borrowing $100. You can do the exact opposite and sell 200 Bitcoins. Uh, okay, okay. So in, okay, in my layman's terms, what you're saying is I can, if I put up $100, I can borrow a, another $100, and yes. it basically you're gonna be extending me credit. Exactly. Okay. And if I lose, and now if I, if I uh, somehow <laughs> the market crashes or something and I lose right. everything, then I'm in debt to you. No, you will not be. Uh, you will have a loss, but you will not be in debt. Oh, because, because it'll be a wash. Debt. It will just, it'll automatically uh, liquidate what I have and then it'll, I'll have nothing. Exactly. So there so, is a margin call. Uh, in traditional stockbroker environment, what margin call means is that they send you a notification mm -hmm. that you have to post more margin. It means you have to deposit more money to your okay. margin. Okay. In the Bitcoin world, there is no edit. So what the margin is going to mean is that you will receive two notifications that your trade is decreasing in value, the trade is going against you. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you will get a notification at 15% drop in the trade. You'll get a second notification at 20% in the trade well. And if you don't liquidate the trade at 25% drop, uh, the algorithm will automatically go ahead, liquidate, uh, split the money uh, back to us and back to you, and you will essentially take a 25% drop in your initial. Okay. We're getting a little bit of feedback. Maybe you can adjust your volume down just a little bit. I think it might be coming out, coming back on your end if you hear that little echo. But okay, I think I got it. So, all right, let me ask you a few of these questions that uh, viewers have submitted. Um, about these kinds of things, especially about compliance, because this is new. <laughs> I mean, in the Bitcoin world, you know, it's kind of in the Wild West, and, there, and a, a lot of uh, the entities are offshore, 
And so when we're talking about USA compliance, it's, it's a whole new ball game. So here are so just some questions I want to throw at you. Um, one was, are, is CampBX licensed as a money transmitter? No. Uh, Bitcoin is not money, according to legal terms, mm -hmm. as of now. So to transmit Bitcoin, you don't need a money service business license. You know, okay. When you're transmitting United States dollar, there is a threshold of $1,000. If you are below that threshold, you do not need to be licensed uh, as a money service business. And that's what we have in place right now. Uh, one more thing we are working on is to get the money service business license. So we will be able to do more than month in US dollars a day tra in transfers. So uh, if we're to understand correctly, as long as you're not allowing people to cash out more than $1,000 at a time, technically it right. wouldn't classify as a... Out, it includes both transfers. It includes deposit and withdrawal. You okay. cannot more than thousand dollars a day you cannot withdraw the more than this. that's considered money transmittal if, if if i deposit more than a thousand or i withdraw more than a thousand that's more even if it's to my own account it's still considered money transmittal no it's not Oh, okay. So, I mean, well, let me let me ask this. This can't BX allow uh, funds transferred from account to account, like ca like uh, U.S. dollar balances. Can I can I send U.S. dollars from my account on Camp BX to Manny's account on Camp BX? No, you can't. You can't. Okay. So, but if I deposit, like, if I were to deposit two thousand dollars into my account and withdraw two thousand dollars from my account, would that be considered money transmittal? You would not be allowed to deposit or withdraw two thousand dollars. So. Our algorithm will stop you as soon as you reach $1,000, and after that you will have to wait 24 hours before you can make any additional transfers. Oh, okay, so it is a limit of $1,000 a day, is that what you're saying? And okay. it is hard-coded, uh, so there's no way around it. So okay. You cannot transfer even one more cent on top of $1,000. Okay, so now, um, and, and you're saying that the reason for that is because of this money transmittal issue. Because I mean, I don't understand how it's like, I guess you're saying that legally it is money transmittal even though I'm putting it into my own account and withdrawing it from my own account? That's still uh, considered... For us, we are transmitting the money for you uh, okay. from one point to other. Oh, okay. All right. And um, so did you speak with a lawyer or do you guys have a legal team where Absolutely. they looked yes. at case uh, studies? The first thing we did, before we start off uh, with the business plan, the uh, first thing we, we did was reach out to Georgia Department of Banking and Finance and request policy clarification. We submitted our, uh, uh, an overview of what we are going to do with our business. And we asked them, what are the regulations and other policies that we need to follow to make sure business is still in Georgia? So, so this issue went pretty high up because Bitcoin was new to Georgia Department of Banking and Finance. It went up a couple of supervisors before we got an answer. But we have written answers to them. We have the policy clarifications. And lawyers built a compliance program based on the policy clarification. So uh, can you repeat the last part that the coders built? Um, what did the coders do? I'm sorry, you broke out for a little bit. Um, Plans, policy, and the algorithms, they are all based on this clarification. Uh, you know, it's, compliance is not something that you can slap on top of a business model. Your business, especially when you're dealing with business, the business, uh, the pay you digital transaction, it has to be built in a certain way. You're compliant from it. Mm, we're not catching it. Maybe, um, can you turn your speakers down just a little bit? Because I think we're getting some feedback and, and Skype is canceling out your audio. I lost your video feed, so. What was that? I lost your view. Yeah, and no, we did that on purpose to give us more bandwidth. <laughs> Skype is playing games again. Um, sometimes if, if the speakers are too loud, it'll give feedback, and that is uh, Skype trying to cancel out that echo. And so just re repeat that last part of, again, because um, I think Skype was canceling it out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, so uh, once we received the clarification from Georgia Department of Banking and Finance, mm -hmm. uh, we gave it to our lawyer uh, and worked with them to build a compliance program. That what rules and what business checks and balances we need to have in place to make sure uh, they're compliant with all rules and regulations. Okay, so you this have a program in place? was also given to our technical teams who are actually doing the programming to make sure that when you write the algorithms, when you write, when you draw up the architecture of the system, where, how different modules talk to each other, there are also some legal implications at the code level, believe it or not. Okay, let me ask, let me get through some of these questions because we're running out of time already. Um, sure. 
How do you calculate the initial margin requirements? Uh, I'm not sure I understand it. Well, like uh, the margin requirements, for example, I mean, you, you give the example, if I have $100, then I can, I can actually use $200 worth. Is it just a two to one ratio or is there an actual formula that you use to calculate that? It is a ratio. Is it two to one? Is that what the ratio is? Yeah, it's called leverage. It's two as to one leverage. So how did, I'm sorry, where, did, where does that it, come if from? If you call it margin, Bruce, it's 50%. 50%. If you call it leverage, it's going to be two as to one. Oh, okay. So it is. It's 50% or 2 to 1. Okay. And, um, never mind, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and will the, um, let's see, this question, will mark to market margin requirements be the same as the initial margin? I don't even know what that means, but this is a question from the audience. Do you know what that means? <laughs> yes. Okay. The margin requirements are based on the value in time. So mark to market means uh, you calculate the margin call at the beginning. Mm -hmm. and uh, you enforce it, and that's what we are going to do. Oh, okay. There is an initial price at the moment of purchase. Your $100, our $100, they combine into a $200 amount, and they go into a dedicated margin account. Mm -hmm. Now, this transaction is timestamped along with the initial price of the transaction. Mm -hmm. So every time we calculate a margin call, it is calculated from the original price. Okay, and then how frequently will, the, will you mark to market? And that's what mark to market is. Uh, when you, it, it, mean, it means you set the value when the transaction is executed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then will, you, will that be updated automatically? I mean, it's, as it's difficult to explain in one sentence, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll be happy to answer the question in more detail on our support form, mm -hmm. okay. uh, support help desk system. Yeah. Okay, and what, what are the, what's the protocol for liquidation of positions when a margin call can't be met? Sorry, I could not hear you. Oh, I was saying, what, uh, what will be the protocol for liquidation of positions when a margin call cannot be met? Right. Uh, we, the algorithm is smart enough to know uh, how much of a trade size to allow based on the liquidity. Mm -hmm. If there is a drastic drop in market liquidity from the time when you open the account, uh, from the time when you open the trade to the time when you liquidate the trade, uh, we will have some of the loans. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, okay. Some more questions about compliance. W uh, will a W nine tax form be required? W nine tax form. Right. Um, the uh, apparently that's a that's a U.S. tax uh, requirement. And also asking if like day trading profits declared to the IRS as income is that going to happen? So what you, uh, when you are day trading Bitcoin, uh, this, the income that you generate, it, const it is technically a bartering income in the tax chart. Okay. So any profit that you make on Camp BA, you, you have to declare it on your IRS form as bartering or cited. Okay, so uh, just so I can repeat it so the audience could hear. Uh, Basically, um, any profit made from Camp BX, or I suppose this extends to Bitcoin in general, has to be um, sort of identified on your tax forms as barter and trade. Correct. And will this be reported to the IRS by Camp BX? No, it is not. Uh, in the United States, it is a responsibility of the individual to make sure that tax forms are accurate. Okay. And now what about tax withholding on foreign accounts or those accounts without a social security number? Uh, sorry, couldn't hear you, Bruce. Oh, the question was, what about um, tax withholding on foreign accounts or those accounts without a social security number? Uh, we do not allow foreign accounts right now. Oh, okay. So, so it's only US. We are United States only. Okay. So there's no non-US accounts that takes care of that. And um, if IRS declarations are eventually required, how will you calculate cost basis, cost basis for Bitcoins deposited on the exchange? Uh, I'm not sure. I think this is something that we will have to run by our CPA. So okay. we have engaged a CPA firm who are going to manage the taxes for us. Okay. And then I got and one I'm more. Sure they know all the answers. Okay. Uh, the all right. Then one last question. This is, will the aggregate total of short positions be public data? Aggregate total of short positions. Uh, that is something we are not considered uh, publishing yet. Uh, mm -hmm. The short positions, they will be visible to you. If you have a short position, mm -hmm. you will know how much of short you have, of course, uh, but we are not going to publish that uh, 
to the public as of now. Not publicly, okay. Okay, and we, wow, I got in those quizzes. I can't believe it. We're just in the nick of time because we're at 59 minutes and 24 seconds. Well, I want to thank you, um, Kiefer, thank you. for joining us. And uh, uh, Kiefer Mithawa, ha, ha, <laughs> I can't say it, but campbx.com. And uh, welcome to the Bitcoin community and happy anniversary, happy three weeks. Thank you. All right. <laughs> thanks Thank you very much us. for answering everything. Yes, thanks so much. And we will see you same time tomorrow, 2 p.m. Eastern, every day, Monday through Friday. Thanks for joining us on the Bitcoin Show. Thank you.